Okay, so then let's get started. Um, so here is a bit of a course overview. Um, today we will mainly talk in course one a little bit about Ross architecture and philosophy. What are the basic concepts like master, Ross nodes, Ross topics. Uh, we will introduce you to launch file, Catkin workspace, and Gazebo simulator. Um, and then we will give introduction uh, to the exercise. So Tom and I will change. Uh, today I will give the lecture, then on Wednesday Tom will give the lecture, then again me, and then again Tom. And then course five, which is next, next Friday, so 5th of March, this will be given by Harmish and Maximilian uh, from Anybotics, and they will show you a bit of how they use ROS uh, for other robots. So here is core structure. Um, so what is important here is to see that you always have lectures and then you have uh, exercise introduction and then there's the exercise time. So deadline for each exercise is before the next lecture. So now we have course on Monday and then on Wednesday you have deadline for the exercise one and you should have received invitation links uh, on Piazza. Then we have lecture two, exercise two intro, and then you have again time to solve the exercise, and then deadline it will be again uh, before the lecture on Friday. Uh, lecture, lecture four will be a bit longer. Here we will give introduction to ROS2, and then on, on the last day, of course, there's the multiple choice test, which most likely will start again early thing in the morning, where physical presence is mandatory. And then we will give you a break to go home or find a space uh, to plug in your computer, connect, and then we will start normally with uh, grading the exercise four, then there will be case study, uh, and then Max and Harmish uh, will present. Then you have to solve the exercise five and also hand it out on the same day uh, because the course ends. Uh, so today we are course one. Uh, basically course is divided into three sessions. Uh, first you have a grading session which starts at eight uh, at eight in the morning, but sharp, not like the lecture today at 8.15. And then you have 45 minutes uh, for the TAs to grade you. Then we have a lecture session, which will last until we're finished, but hopefully no longer than an hour. And then you can already start solving your exercises. And then from 10 to 12, the teaching assistants uh, will let you in the exercise session room where then you can also work together, ask for help uh, from teaching assistants. And if you're done the same day, you can also ask teaching assistants to grade you. Um, so each exercise has several questions where you can get some points uh, from zero to 100%. And exercises in total count for uh, 50% of the grade. Uh, you can work together. Moreover, we encourage you to work together. Um, however, at the end, before you call the TA to evaluate your exercise, each of you should so show results individually uh, on their own PC. Um, there's seven TAs and each of them has a group of students assigned and the assignment sheet uh, is posted on Piazza with your student ID numbers and the corresponding group number. Um, so exercises are evaluated by TAs. When you're ready, just call them. You can do it already in the exercise session, but then the latest in the grading session before the next lecture. Uh, TA will take you in a separate breakout room uh, in the Zoom call. Um, they will grade your exercise. And then after that, you basically leave the call. Um, please be aware that if you call the TA to evaluate your exercise, you have a one shot at it. 
So you cannot then go back to the room, solve it, work on it for a bit more. So call the TA when you're ready to present your results. And then on the last day of lecture, uh, there's the multiple choice test, which counts for 50% of the final grade. Uh, it's 45 minutes. The test will be in person. So physical presence is mandatory if you want to pass the course. Uh, and then most likely it will be at eight in the morning. And we will let you know the details on Piazza by the end of this week. Good. Are there any questions related to course logistics? Um, yeah, am I audible? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, maybe I am being obvious, sorry if I missed something, uh, but I just figured out that this uh, course uh, should require some version of Linux, right? So I should have a, a VMware or, or a virtual box of Ubuntu ready. Uh, Correct. I yeah. Yeah. Um, is it all right if I start uh, <laughs> setting it up now because uh, I didn't uh, <laughs> didn't figure? Uh, yes, so you can. Instructions are on the course website. Um, we recommend you to send up set up the VMware virtual machine. However, you can also do a native install, which is strictly better, just a bit more difficult to set up. Uh, and then you can work on the exercise today and tomorrow the whole day, and then you just have to hand it in on at the latest on Wednesday morning. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry for the inconvenience. You're welcome. Okay, then if this was it, so then we continue. Um, so, Edo, just quickly, there are a couple of questions in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. So first one regarding the multiple choice test, this one will happen in the main building in E3, just that everybody knows. Uh, thank you, Marco. I forgot to put it in my slides. And I see a couple of more questions. Uh -huh. I see some people are trying to enter the room. Uh, so I should just admit all of them. Um, so a couple of more questions. Is it mandatory to attend exercise session? Not really, but you have to hand it in. Uh, if we stall, and then I see here another question. How can we get our projects graded if we install Ubuntu as another OS instead of? I'm not sure I understand this question, but you should download VMware Virtual Machine and then instead and then install Ubuntu on it. And then you present your results to TAs by sharing your screen. Okay. Um, so then today we will start with uh, with Ross. Okay, so what is ROS? Uh, ROS, it's an acronym which stands for Robot Operating System. Um, however, it is not an acronym, it is not an operating system. Uh, it's not a native operating system like Windows or maybe Ubuntu, which basically schedules other processes and interacts with hardware. ROS is just kind of a collection of middleware, uh, which lets you build robots uh, and reuse um, software. So it's divided in some components, first of which is kind of plumbing. Um, so this relates to process management and inter-process um, communication. Then there's a bunch of tools that have been developed around ROS, uh, which is basically simulators, if you wanna do some uh, multi-body simulation, or like if you wanna visualize your robot or maybe input from its sensor, uh, such as Gazebo or Arvis, and there's data logging functionality, which can be quite handy uh, if you need to debug something. 
Then there's a bunch of cap capabilities, which is essentially a bunch of algorithms and packages that have been written by other people and that you can use if you're building a new robot. And maybe, for example, you're a control expert and really want to focus uh, on making a great new controller, then you can just take mapping or planning pipeline that already exists. You can take off the shelf algorithms that have been implemented and tested by other people. And then lastly, there's the whole ecosystem, which is essentially package organization. So there's people who make sure that uh, the software is organized into packages that make sense, that are easy to reuse, they distribute it, they make sure that everything builds. And then there's plenty of documentation and tutorials um, that you can find online. So in this course, we will be mainly uh, focusing on plumbing tools and ecosystem and capabilities. Um, so specific algorithms you will work with more in your semester projects uh, or master thesis. Apologize for that. Okay, so a little bit about the history of Ross. It essentially started in 2007 um, at Stanford. Uh, and now it's managed by Open Source Robotics Foundation. Uh, the goal of developing ROS was just like to be able to reproduce results um, across different platforms. Since the problem was to test their algorithm, everyone would make their own infrastructure for communication, for process management, for interacting with hardware. And then overall, if I, for example, had something running, it would be for Ross, it would not be very easy for you um, to get this, to get my algorithm running uh, on your robot. And hence, Ross was developed such that all the low level um, stuff and process management is standardized and such that it's easier to reproduce um, the results. Um, so what it's, Ross philosophy, it's like peer-to-peer -peer communication where a bunch of different programs can communicate over some um, predefined interface. It is a distributed system, which means you can have your nodes running anywhere. You can have them running locally on your machine. You can have them running over the network. You can have them running over 4G on a machine that might be some kilometers away. Uh, whatever, as long as they're connected. Uh, ROS is language agnostic. So in the sense that ROS modules that communicate with each other via this peer-to-peer -peer communication. So these modules can be written in any language. Um, in this course, we will mainly work with C++, but you can also use Python and since recently MATLAB, Java, and other languages. Uh, the idea of ROS is to be lightweight. So ROS is just meant to be a wrapper around, around non-ROS code. So for example, if I were to write some control algorithm, um, you would write non-ROS algorithmics and then just wrap it with some ROS uh, communication calls. And then ROS is free and open source. So most software, you can just go online, go on GitHub, you can find it. Uh, and then you can even, if you see a bug, you can dig down, fix it, uh, and then ask people to merge your fix uh, into the code base. Okay, so we start with ROS master which is kind of the central, which is kind of the brain of the whole ROS communication. Uh, and it's essentially a process that's running and it just manages communication between other nodes. So every node at startup has to register with ROS master. 
And then with the help of Rosmaster, nodes know how to communicate between each other. You can start a master by typing Roscore um, into your terminal. And we will try this. Um, we will try this later on. So then there is something that's called ROS nodes. Um, and each node, you can think of it kind of as a single purpose uh, program. So it just one node should do one functionality. For example, gathering sensor data or computing joint torques or sending plan to the controller. Uh, they can be individually compiled, executed, and managed. Um, they are organized in packages. So if you were to run one node, you can just in your terminal type ROS run, and then you would put a package name such that then ROS knows where to look for this node. And then you put name of the executable. Uh, and then the ROS can run uh, this executable. So all nodes have to register with the ROS master, uh, and hence ROS master should be running before you try to run uh, a ROS node. You can see a list of active nodes if you just do ROS node list in your terminal, and then you will you will basically get a get an output uh, with all the all the nodes that are all the nodes that are currently active and registered uh, within this ROS master. If you type ROS node info and then node name, you will get more info about the nodes, such as maybe which topics is it publishing on, which topics is it subscribed on, is it active, is it still alive, uh, etc. So then there's something that it's called ROS topics, uh, which is essentially topic is just a stream of messages that can be sent uh, between different nodes. Um, so typically one node, uh, the node can either publish or subscribe to a topic. And usually you have one publisher and then whoever needs this topic, they will subscribe to it. So you can have uh, many subscribers. Uh, and in principle, nothing stops you from having more nodes publishing on the same topic, um, but it's not very common. So once the node advertises a topic, first what it does, it registers this within ROS master. And then ROS master can basically dispatch this topic and messages to every other node that is uh, subscribing to this topic. And then once this advertising and subscribing process is over, then for example, this node one can publish on some topic and then uh, node two can subscribe and maybe some other nodes uh, can also subscribe on it. So you can get list of active topics if you just write ROS topic list in your, in your terminal. Um, and then you can inspect them. So these, these ROS topic tools here, they're useful for analysis. If you maybe start your robot and you wanna see is everything alive, is it run it? So if you say ROS topic info, you will get which node is publishing this topic. Um, you will be, it will tell you also uh, which nodes are subscribing to this topic. And if you do ROS topic echo, um, then you can basically print contents of, of the messages that are being streamed on the topic uh, into your terminal. So then ROS messages, th these are basically messages that are published on the topic. And these are kind of the data these are data structures that nodes then send um, between each other. So basically definition of a message, this defines kind of type of a topic. This can be something as simple as an integer uh, or maybe as a string, but you can also, there are more complicated message types. And most importantly, you can also build them um, yourself. 
So it's basically like, like uh, making structures in C++ where you can just uh, compose your arbitrary structures, which is made of some basic types like integer floats, strings, uh, and arrays of objects. Uh, they are defined in dot message files. So for example, if I want to define uh, angular velocity message, I would maybe write angular velocity dot message. And then inside, I would probably have three floats or three doubles, which would just be then angular velocity around each of the axes. You can see type of, of a topic if you just do ROS topic type. Uh, and then it will tell you, is this a string? Is this maybe some custom type integer or whatever? Uh, and you can also, as you will do in the exercise, uh, you can publish a message to a topic. If you just do ROS topic publish, then name of the topic, uh, type of the message that you want to publish. And then you can actually write out the data that you want to publish um, in the terminal. If you want to find more information about all of this, so there's always in the bottom right corner, there's a link which basically leads you to wikiros.org, which is full of um, tutorials and documentation. So here is one example. Um, so this is post stamped message. Um, and it's this post stamped message, it's a fairly big. Uh, it's a big message and it's comprised of multiple uh, simpler messages, which basically tells you that you can just as a regular structure in C or C++ or your favorite language, you can just take simpler types and compose them together um, to make more complicated message. So here, for example, this message point just has three doubles, X, Y, Z. And then it's it's contained inside this inside this more complicated post stamp message, um, which basically has one of the members which is pose, and then pose is defined by position, uh, which is represented by this simpler message point, and then it's also defined by orientation, uh, which is then another simpler message quaternion, which is again comprised of. Uh, four doubles. You can also have, um, for example, this, this sensor message image. Uh, you can also have a header where you can maybe send some extra information um, about this message, which is like sequence number or time step stamp, which you might need if you are trying to do some time synchronization between your nodes. And then there's also some geometric information um, like this frame ID. If you now wanna maybe transform this image um, into another frame such that then you know uh, which transform you should look up. You can also use uh, arrays of data. For example, here in this, uh, in this image message, this is all just kind of information about the image and these are all single single elements but this the last row this basically unsigned int 8 is basically array of values and this is how you then declare arrays in your in your dot message file so internally inside of c++ the code that will be generated from this is just a it's just an std vector Uh, what you will also sometimes see once you start working with the code from GitHub, or maybe once you take on a semester project in, in some of the labs, so you will see that people sometimes use ROS nodelets. Um, and these are, it's the same concept as a ROS node um, in the sense that it's just like a single compiled executable that does ideally only one function. Uh, however, the main difference is that ROS nodes, when they communicate with each other, they incur some overhead simply because you need to take your data, 
then serialize it, marshal it, and then send over the network, which all takes some time. However, if, you're, if all of your nodes are running on the same machine, then there's no need to do that. And then you can actually define nodelets, which are smart enough, and they can figure, they can figure out that maybe sender and receiver are on the same computer, and they, they can just pass data around uh, without basically this extra overhead um, of copying. However, if your nodelets are on, on different machines, um, then there's no way around copying and then even nodelets uh, will copy the data. So like a thumb rule is basically try to use ROS nodes first, just implement something simple. And then if this is not fast enough or not good enough for your application, um, then what you can try to do is uh, try to implement some nodelets, which are a bit more complicated. Okay. Uh, so basically now we will try to run some of these tools that, that I presented like ROS core, ROS topics uh, in the terminal such that you can see a bit what's going on. So I will start my virtual machine and just open up a terminal and then you can all together try to replicate what I'm doing. Okay, so let's put it maybe. Oh. Okay, so for those of you, uh, can you see this well? There should be slides on the right-hand side and there should be a terminal on the left-hand side. Yep, we can see that. Okay, thank you. So now if you have your virtual machine up and running, uh, you can just start a terminal and you can either click here on this uh, left-hand side on the Terminator, which will pop up a console for you. Or you can also just press control Alt uh, and then this will also open up a new terminal. So then if you just type ROS score, this will basically start the ROS master. Uh, and now you can see here, it tells you a bit. So it tells you where the output is being logged to, which is just in a hidden folder inside your home folder. Um, then it checks maybe that your hard disk is not too cluttered with the old data. If, if this were the case, this would be red and you would get a warning. And then you can simply clean this by typing uh, ROS clean. Uh, it tells you what's your ROS version. So in our case, this is, uh, sorry, distribution. This is ROS Noetic, uh, and this is the version. And then basically it starts the master process uh, with this process PID, and it starts the ROS out, which is just here to uh, log the data. And so what we will do now is we will start the talker node, which is just a node that will publish some data on one topic. So if you can maybe maximize your terminal. And now we will open a new tab, which you can do either by right click, and then you can say split horizontally. Or if you want to impress the person that is looking at your screen, you can also do control shift O. Uh, and then it will it will split the terminal uh, also horizontally. So now you can do ROS run, which is basically a command telling telling ROS that we want to start a node. And now you can start typing ROS CPP. And then if you click tab, basically it will do autocomplete for you. So now it's it's doing autocomplete, and it realizes that there's four packages that match this criteria. So it's ROS CPP, ROS CPP serialization, 
ROS CPP traits and ROS CPP tutorials. So you can just start typing tutorials, click tab, uh, and then it will auto complete for you. And now we have to give name of the node that we want to run, which in our case is talker. Uh, so now these are all the options here uh, that we can run, but we will just start typing talker, then click tab, uh, and then we're ready to go, then hit enter. So now this has started basically a small CPP executable, which just now publishes, uh, publishes this message here, message of type string, string, and it's also showing us output in the terminal uh, what it's publishing. Um, so now we will open up another terminal uh, or another tab, and then we will inspect a bit what this node is doing. So maybe you can click on your upper tab, and if you do again, right click, you can say split vertically, or you can press Control Shift E, and then the term and the tab will be split vertically like this. So now, if I write ROS node list, um, this basically tells me that there's now two nodes active: one which is this ROS out for data logging, and then there's one node talker which we just ran um, in the terminal tab below. So now I can make some, let's say I want to know uh, a bit more about this node. I can just write ROS node info talk, talker. You can also use tab. Tab is really your best friend when you work with ROS. And so here now it tells me some information um, about this node. So it says, the name of the node, it tells me which topics is it publishing on. So it's this chatter, which is just publishing message of type string uh, with these contents in it, hello world, and then the, the order number. Uh, and then it basically tells me, so no one has subscribed to any of these topics yet. And it advertises some more services. It tells me the PID, also the process ID of that node. Uh, you can also do ROS topic. Uh, if you do ROS topic list, you get list. Uh, if you don't make a typo and write ROS topic list, again, you get list of all the topics. And let's say now we're interested maybe in this uh, chatter topic. So you can just do ROS topic info, chatter. Um, and then here we can see the type of the messages that are being streamed on this chatter topic. Uh, and then we can see that they're of type just string. And we can see which node is publishing them, which is then this uh, the talker node running in the in the lower terminal. Um, okay, so now you can also look a bit, uh, let's say we already know this, but let's say for, for the purpose of just trying and learning, we can also look up type of this chapter topic. Uh, and now it tells us just that this is a topic of type string. We can also inspect um, what are the contents of these messages. Um, so basically what you see in the lower terminal, this is node, talker node directly printing out on the screen, but it's also sending the messages uh, with this same content. So you can do ROS topic echo, and now we will basically just print the stream of messages that are being broadcasted on this topic. And you can see that essentially it's the same thing as what this node here is writing um, or spitting out on the screen. Um, you can also inspect maybe uh, with the, you can analyze the frequency. How quick is this node publishing? Uh, so you can write ROS topic age set and then we want to test this for the topic chapter. Oops. Or just tab. Yeah. Um, so basically, what this command does, it creates a little buffer 
uh, and then it, it will buffer the nodes there and then it will measure times. And so now it tells me that this node here, that this topic chapter is being published at 10 Hertz, uh, which is what I can see here. So here's some extra statistics about it. Um, but this is this is the most relevant number, um, which tells me that it's 10 hertz. Okay, and so now we will start a listener node, and you can again just split your lower terminal such that now you have these kind of four tabs, this window like structure. And then here, what we can do is we can do ROS run, ROS CPP tutorials. And then you can again help yourself with the tab. So now we will run a listener node. And so what this listener node is doing, it's just basically subscribing to this topic uh, chatter, uh, which is being broadcasted by this talker node. And then it's just, uh, once it subscribes and receives the message, it just spits it out here in the terminal. So you probably cannot see this because it's quite fast, but just believe me that I heard message here and then in the right terminal, this hello world and the numbers are the same as the ones um, in the left terminal. So if you now do, uh, so if we now analyze this a bit, if we just right now ROS node list, so we can see that now we have uh, three nodes active. So two were already there before, the talker and the ROS out node, but now we also started um, the listener. And now if you do ROS topic info, and if you look, look up this chapter topic, um, so now it tells me that um, the type of message is a string, which I already knew from before. It also tells me that there's talker publisher, which already we knew from before, but now before we had no subscribers. And now we also have here um, the listener subscriber. And now we will try to publish a message from the console. So for example, if I now, kill this uh, publisher, the talker node, which should be in the lower bottom, left lower tab of your terminal. You can kill it with control C. And now if you look again here, ROS topic, if you look ROS node list, so now I see that there's only listener node active because we just killed this one. And so what we will try to do is now we'll just publish our own uh, custom message uh, from the terminal. So this you can do if you just type ROS topic, then pub, uh, and then, so this just tells, tells ROS that you wanna publish a message from the terminal. And then you can type chatter, which is name of the topic that you wanna publish to. Uh, just give me a second. I need to admit some people to the waiting room. Okay, they should have joined now. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, okay, so we want to publish on topic chatter. And then if you already click tab, the console will infer automatically that this is of type string. And then if you click another tab, so then you can actually type the data in here that you want to publish. So we can do maybe ETH ROS course. And now you can also see in the lower terminal that this listener node has, has received this message and that the data is exactly uh, what we published here. You can also publish another message, maybe this time with number two, and you can see again that our listener node um, has heard the exact same message. Okay, good. Uh, are there any questions related to 
ROS tools like ROS topic, ROS nodes. Okay, then we just resume this time with full screen. Um, so then there's something which will be very important for you once you start working on your exercises or on your project is the ROS workspace environment, which kind of defines the context that you are working on, that you're working within. Uh, and so what this context means, means basically which packages should, should then programs use inside your workspace. For example, if I maybe have two different versions of packages installed on my system, or one is maybe built in release mode, one is built in debug mode, you can tell your workspace to use either one um, or the other, which is then uh, depends on, on the application, depends what you want to do inside that workspace. Um, so when you when you start a terminal, um, so how does how does basically ROS know where to look for all the packages and executables? It simply knows because you always in the background this setup dot bash script um, is executed, and this bash script then sets correct environment variables and like cache stuff, cache entries such that then ROS knows uh, where to look this for. So this is, uh, I guess this is a bit of an old, this is an old uh, entry here while ROS, while we were still using ROS kinetic. But for you, basically what happens is when you start a terminal, this line is executed in your bash RC, except it says opt ROS melodic setup dot bash. Uh, and if you open up your bash RC, you can see that this is um, set up there. And then this is how ROS, know, ROS knows where to look for talker node, where to look for the listener node, um, et cetera. You can also, so this is kind of the global uh, environment. You can also define your Catkin workspace, which is typically where you will work on your projects. Uh, and then you would usually name it Catkin workspace or I don't know, semester project workspace or ROS course workspace or whatever. And then you would build maybe some programs there. And once this is done, you would have to execute basically again, one setup.bash script, which will then be contained in this devil folder of your Catkin workspace. And then this setup.bash script again just tells ROS to now also look for programs inside your Catkin workspace and not just inside this kind of global um, ROS install. You can also check um, what, is, what is the package path if you just echo this um, environment variable. This like ROS uh, one Catkin workspace is provided for you uh, in the installation on your on the virtual machine. Uh, so then, as I mentioned, inside the workspace, typically you would maybe build some packages uh, and build some pro build some programs. And for this, we use Catkin build system, which is just like ROS system to generate executables and libraries. Sometimes you will also see um, that people have in some older tutorials or instructions Catkin make, uh, but we recommend you to use Catkin build since it's just a newer, newer version. In the background, they essentially do the same thing. They just compile some C++ code, um, but Catkin build is newer and also has nicer terminal output. Uh, what you should not do is you should definitely not mix the two. If you, if you choose to use one, then stick to it. Because there's simply a bit of difference in terms of how they, where they put built files and how they generate, uh, how they generate cache. 
Um, you can build a package if you go to your Capkin workspace, and then if you type Capkin build, and then you write package name. So what this will do is it will search for this package inside your workspace, and if it doesn't find it, it will complain. Uh, but if it does find it, then it will run the G++ compiler on your, on your code. Uh, and if everything is successfully built, uh, then you need to, last step that you need to do is you need to update your environment, which is just basically tell uh, Ross where now to look for the code that you have just built. And you do this, again, if you just do source, and then inside the devil folder, this setup.bash script. So often if you maybe build your packages, but stuff doesn't run or you get weird red letters in your terminal, uh, most likely you have just forgotten to source your workspace. And then you just do source devil setup.bash and then things should run smoothly. Um, so what Catkin build system does, uh, it essentially there's three folders that will generate inside your workspace. So there is first folder uh, source, which is where you work and where you put your code. So if you are to write maybe some, I don't know, really cool mapping algorithm, you would put your code and organize it in some packages that make sense inside the source folder. Uh, you can then create new code. You can also call it clone existing code. And this is the code that you want to build. Once you type Capkin build, um, two other folders will be generated, which you do not touch, or there is usually no need to touch them. Um, so then this build space will be generated where CMake is invoked and when maybe some intermediate build results are stored together with the uh, cache information. And then once, once, you, uh, once the build is finished, all the generated binaries, executables together with header files will be copied into this development or devil space, uh, where then this is where you can, uh, this is where build targets live. And then when you type ROS run, or as you will see later, ROS launch, they're executed from this folder. However, there's no need for you to manually copy them or worry about where they're placed. This is all done in the background uh, for you. If maybe you get some results that don't make sense, or you maybe you build everything in debug mode, but now it's too slow and you wanna maybe rebuild it in, in the release mode. So what you can do is catkin clean. And what this will do is it will clean the build folder and the devil folder. So all of your cache and your build targets will be gone. However, it will not touch your source code. And then you can just again invoke catkin build and maybe build um, with different configuration. Um, if you wanna get more info on, the, on your configuration of your build system, you can just type catkin config uh, inside your workspace. And then it will basically tell you maybe, so it will tell you that you are extending on top of Optros system install, which at the time of creating this picture was Indigo. Um, but what you would get here now is Optros Noetic. And then that you're also uh, searching for files inside your local Capkin workspace inside the devil folder. Uh, you can also pass some additional CMake arguments uh, through this kind of catkin build interface. Uh, you can do this just by making catkin build, and then you can pass CMake args. And for example, in this case, we're passing the build type to be uh, to build in the release mode. 
You can also do some fancier stuff here where you tell Catkin build to generate project files for the Eclipse, also um, to use the C11, um, et cetera. Okay, so now we will do another example um, where basically now we will clone one one git folder one catkin package from github we will put it in the in our local catkin workspace and build it so now i will again switch to this kind of split screen setup and if you now you can now close the ter the four terminals inside your virtual machine such that you get this nice blue screen and then what you can do is you can just open Firefox and you can follow this link here, or you can just type in the search engine GitHub leg robotics like this. And then you can click on the first link that pops up. And what we will do is we will clone this Ross uh, best practices uh, Git repository. So this is just, uh, it's like a Git repository, which contains ROS package, which is called ROS package template. And this package is, it's just a template that you can use to build your other packages. And it's set up in the way that follows like ROS convec conventions and best practices. So now we're gonna clone this uh, if you just click here on this green tab, and if you select this, uh, we will clone it, use it HTTPS. If you have your Git key set up, you can also clone it, use it SSH. So you just put control C. And now we will open one terminal and we will navigate to Git folder here. And you can just do control shift V uh, to paste the URL. And then if you type home button, it will home button will basically get you to the beginning of the line. You can type git clone, click enter. And now what we have done, we have just copied this repository from GitHub into onto our machine uh, together with something that's called git history which basically shows how this repository has evolved over time. Uh, so then you can navigate to the folder workspaces and you can go to getting started workspace, which is already set up for you. So you can see that we already built some packages here and hence we have this build and devil uh, folders together with logs we're just any kind of errors or warnings might be logged. But we will go into the source folder where our source code lives. So here an is an example of, the, of one package, my first package. But what we will do now is we will create a sim link pointing to the git repo that we just cloned. So we will do ln s. And now we have to tell the simlink generator, where is the target um, that we want to generate the simlink for? So you can just put this tilde, which means your home folder, and then forward slash git, and then tab again will show you what are the best, what are the options. And so for us, this would be Ross best practices, which is the thing that we just cloned and you can click enter. And now what you can see if I do ls here, so now it tells me that it has made a sim link, which is called uh, ROS best practices. Uh, and then this sim link points to, if I type basically this ls dash all, so this points to home ROS git, uh, it points to this folder here. Uh, okay. So now you can see if you type catkin config, which is what we've seen earlier, we have seen that 
Catkin workspace has been generated for us and we're extending on top of Noetic system install. And then there's no additional CMake arguments um, passed here. You can also make this a bit bigger. Maybe it's nicer for you. Uh, so if I now do Catkin build, and if I now put the name of the package that I want to build, if I press tab, uh, it should show me all the options, which is basically two packages that we have in our workspace. So I will just build ROS package template here. And now the build is running and all these uh, binaries and targets are generated and placed inside build and devil folder. And so now what we should do before we can run our package, we need to tell Ross where to look uh, for all the stuff, which we just do by sourcing the devil setup.bash. And now I should be able to just Ross launch, which is something that you will see in a minute what it is. So we do ROS launch and then I type package name, which is ROS best practices, I believe. Or no, ROS, yes, ROS best practices. And hmm, it seems that we don't have any launch files here. Maybe I just have to see. Ah, ROS package template. So, okay. So you have to type ROS launch and then ROS package template. Uh, and then you can just do ROS package template dot launch. Again, tab shows you all the options. And if we run this, so we will go in a minute over what ROS launch does. But so what you can see here that it just, it launched three nodes, the master node, the ROS out, the logging node, and then it launched one process ROS package template, which just printed out successfully launched a node. Uh, okay, so this is, basically what we just did here. You can see that we launched a node and now we'll go back to kind of full screen mode and we still have to go through what ROS launch is. So ROS launch is just a tool that lets you, it allows you to launch multiple nodes uh, at once and you can also set some parameters inside what it's called launch files. So these launch files are written just as XML files with the suffix dot launch. And another thing that it's nice is if, if your ROS core or ROS master is not running, launch will automatically start one for you. So if you remember when we run the talker and the listener node, we have we had to start ROS core manually. But if we start them with ROS launch, um, it will just automatically start ROS core for you. So you can launch, launch files can be started with, there's kind of two ways. One is you can just navigate to the folder which contains the launch file. And then there directly, you can do ROS launch and then name of the file. You can also give a full path to the file and then you can do it also for somewhere else. And you can also start a launch file from kind of anywhere on your system. If you just type ROS launch and then you write package name and then the file name that you wanna launch. So this is what we did here earlier where we uh, say so here, where we did ROS launch and then name of the package was ROS package template. And then we just built, uh, we just launched this file, ROS package template 
.launch, which is just an XML file. So how these files are structured, um, they're just XML file that always start and end with this uh, dot .launch uh, bracket. And then inside here, you can launch uh, multiple nodes. Um, so then each node starts basically with a node tag where you tell what it's the name of that node. Um, so here you can give an arbitrary name. Then you tell the launch file uh, in which package, this PKG, where should Ross look for this node? So in this case, if we want to launch a node with name listener, we have to look inside Ross CPP tutorials. And then type means it's just the name of the executable uh, that we have to run. So in this case, this is uh, listener. And then it just, the last tag here output just says uh, to print everything on the screen, but you could also maybe put uh, to, to dump everything into a log file, which might be useful if you're working directly on the robot or and if you don't have um, if you don't have a screen connected. Uh, so important thing here is you should notice the difference uh, for these tags. If you put like this launch tag and then if you again close cl close it with launch, you can have kind of multiple elements inside these brackets where you have these self-closing tags where you just start with tag once at the beginning and then you just close it with this forward uh, slash here, then you can basically only have uh, one element. In this case, we only have one node element inside uh, these tags and then same uh, for the second node. So if, if you get some errors, the launch file is invalid or then maybe it cannot parse it or whatever. Um, first thing to look for is to see whether you have uh, properly open and closed uh, all of these tags. Um, you also have to be careful. So each, each one of these arguments here, it has to be inside these uh, quotation marks. So then be careful if you're copying and pasting code from internet, usually uh, in the beginning, people tend to forget these quotation marks. So how are these launch files structured? Uh, we went through a very simple launch file at the beginning, um, but what you can do with them is you can reuse multiple launch files and you can nest them together uh, and also pass arguments from top level uh, to the bottom level. So inside this launch file here on the right hand side, it again starts with launch tag and it ends with launch tag here. And then here we have some uh, arguments where arg is basically tells the launch file, okay, this is an argument, this is a value that I can maybe pass. And then we just have here name of this argument. For example, here we have use simulation time and then the value for this argument, which is then it's right now set to true. And now uh, if you wanna inside the launch file evaluate, think of this use sim time now as a variable which contains, uh, which contains the value true. So now, if you want to now evaluate and look what's inside this use simulation time argument, uh, you can just invoke and evaluate using this syntax here, where you have this dollar sign and then arg and then arg name. So here we're telling if this is set to true, uh, and right now it is because this here is true, uh, what what ROS launch will do 
is it will then create a parameter on the parameter server uh, with this name and it will set uh, its value to true. And then you can also pass these arguments uh, down to the other launch files. So here, if you look, this tag includes, this basically means that we're including another launch file, which is then inside this uh, gazebo ROS package. And it's inside a launch folder and it's called emptyworld.launch. Uh, so when working with launch files or in general with ROS, you should not use absolute paths. So you should not just copy paste, maybe, I don't know, home and then your username and then the rest of the path. Because then if you give this ROS package to your friend who maybe has a different username, um, it will not work on his machine. So you should then use this find command, which will then find where this package is on your machine. Uh, and then you should kind of index everything relative to this uh, package, to this package path. And now we just say, hey, once you're inside the package path, uh, once you're inside the package, go inside the launch folder and then find uh, this launch file. And then again, so here, now you can see that inside these include brackets, we again are passing some arguments to this empty underscore world launch file. And so here maybe we're passing, so for example, this physics argument here, uh, what it tells is its value, it will just evaluate this arg physics variable here. And then if we look up, we can see that this is still to ODE. So this means that the physics engine that will be run inside Gazebo will just be uh, ODE. Basically, this ODE will be substitute here and passed to the other launch file. And then by nesting these launch files and like using arguments, you can actually, uh, it's easy to run quite complex systems that can basically consist of dozens um, of different nodes. You can also pass arguments from the, from the command line. If you just do ROS launch and then name of the launch file, and you can say then argument name, basically this kind of colon equal sign, which just means assign this value to the argument uh, with this name here. And then if you want more examples, you can also look them up um, under this link. Uh, so this is essentially what we went through. And now the last, the last point is this Gazebo simulator. Uh, I apologize, I just need to put on my light. It's, it's uh, sorry, the roll shutters roll down and then it's a bit dark in the room. Uh, okay, so Gazebo simulator is just like uh, it's included on your virtual machine. And it's a tool that allows you to simulate uh, 3D rigid body dynamics, which in our case just means like multi-body robots. So maybe like robotic arms or maybe something more complex like quadrupedal robots. Or here in this case, as you can see, which is skid steer base, which is, uh, which is just a husky robot. You can also simulate uh, different sensors, including noise. Uh, you can also, there's also a renderer, as you can see here on the right hand side. Uh, and you can also interact with the simulator, like starting, pausing simulations, and you can also add objects here inside a simulation inside this toolbar. Uh, so Gazebo provides a ROS interface such that you can also then use it with ROS. And it's extensible with plugins, which is just means that you can write a piece of code and customize behavior, behaviors of each of these elements that you hear um, inside the simulation. 
You can also, there are many plugins that already exist and that you can just use. You can run Gazebo uh, with just ROS run, Gazebo, ROS, Gazebo, which will just start an empty uh, simulation. And so this brings us to the end of this lecture. Um, so now for further references, um, I guess here in the course, you can ask us, you can ask TAs, but in the future, once you start working on your own projects, this Ross Wiki is a great source of information uh, where you have detailed explanation about what the code is doing, how to install it. And then there's plenty of uh, tutorials that you can just follow. If you're learning something new, maybe how to use new sensor or something. There's also a list of available packages inside the ROS system. Uh, then together with some cheat sheets and then the best, best practices, the ROS package template, which we cloned uh, earlier in the lecture. So now before, before this lecture is done, I want to bring your attention to maybe some things that will be relevant in the summer and to try to motivate you uh, to do well in this course. Uh, so in this course, we will work only with simulation. But even if you're not starting a semester project or a master thesis, you will basically have the opportunity to work on real robots during this ETH robotics uh, summer school. So this will take place beginning of July uh, with lectures, tutorials, and then in the end, there will be a robotic challenge. Uh, it will take place in this Bangen an der Aare, uh, which is just a training village, which some of you uh, might know. Uh, it's basically from the military and then you get like this training round where then your robot can go and do uh, different tasks. So here's the application window uh, and you still have about a month left if you're interested. And this is the robotic platform that will be used um, during the summer school. So it's, it's one just skid steer base, which is called Super Megabot, uh, which has some sensors. Some of you, maybe you can see here, there's a LIDAR, there's a depth camera, there's some more cameras, um, inertial sensing units. And then with these guys, you will basically learn uh, different concepts and then implement them uh, on this machine. And this is the robot that will be used also uh, in the ROS course uh, for the exercises. So if you see some, if you see something in simulation that looks like this, this is just a super mega boat. So here's a bit just a program such that you have an idea of what will happen during the summer school. So you will get tutorials in different topics like state estimation, path planning, localization, mapping, which then you get to implement on the robot. And then basically you have almost full two days of robot time where you get to then play around on the robot and try all of the stuff they just learned and then you have a challenge where you basically are divided into teams and you have to uh, you have to fulfill whatever the task it is. So this is I will just play this briefly. This is the preview from robotics summer school of uh, I think two years ago where there was about 50 students, 25 international, 25 from Eteha and where they worked with super megabots. Uh, and the task that they were trying to fulfill was kind of autonomous exploration. So they had to go in this uh, training round and look for April tags and then uh, report their position. Uh, and then the team who would win, who would find the most tags correctly, uh, they would win. So in total, there were four groups, if I remember correctly. 
um, with four robots. So one robot per group. And here you can see robots uh, departing on an autonomous mission. Okay. So this, now the lecture is really over. Uh, apologize for a bit over time. Uh, so Tom and I, as mentioned, we will be teaching the course this year. If you have any questions, feel free to write on Piazza. Uh, if we don't answer there, only then please send us an email. If you have any questions about the Ross course, you go to us. If you have questions about the summer school, then please do not contact us. Please go to this web page here, robotics-summerschool.ethz.ch, or just Google it if it's very easy to find. And then please ask your uh, summer school related questions um, there. So then you can now already start working on your exercises, which I will give now a brief intro uh, into how it should look like. Uh, and then the TAs will be with you from 10 to 12. Um, are there any questions? Okay, so if not, then we will quickly go back to our virtual machine, which I hope you can still see. And so now if you go uh, to the course website, the exercise should be uploaded. Uh, oh. Yes, there we go. So now if you look, this is the first exercise sheet. Uh, and they're always kind of organized the same way. So here we just tell you which concepts we would like you uh, to take from this exercise. And then there are some tasks that you have to do. And then at the end, there are these evaluation points uh, which are then like small tasks that you have to show to the TA. And then based on this, uh, you will be graded. So each exercise has 100% uh, uh, and then there's five of them and they contribute to 50% of your grade. So here you need to download this super megabot simulation that you've just seen. Um, you need to run it and then maybe play around a bit with the nodes and see what each of these commands will output. Uh, if you wanna, there's also links if you wanna get more information, uh, more information about them. Uh, and then in the end, what you need to do is you need to write a single launch file, uh, which has to start the simulation and has to start simulation inside a different world than the default one, which is the empty world. So here, as an example, I'm using this RoboCup world, but you can also use something else. Uh, and it also needs to start a tail layout node, which then allows you to operate the robot with your keyboard. So the way this should look like is if we maybe just now fill this terminal and if we now go to workspaces, SMB workspace source. So now, don't forget to source your workspace, otherwise you won't be able to run things. And now we can just launch uh, exercise one solution, which is just one launch file, which now ideally will start gazebo and, and the robot inside it. 
So here we're getting some red letters, which is just gazebo complaining about some colors, but you should not worry about it. If you see some nodes dying, um, then you should worry about it. So this is how it looks like. Um, this is the robot. Uh, maybe it's a bit laggy now, but with the stream, but on your machines, it should be better. And here I'm starting the node in a separate terminal, but you don't have to do that. You can also run the node from the main terminal. What you should just remember is if you wanna move the robot, you have to press your keyboard, but you also have to have the terminal window selected. So if I now press my keyboard, nothing will happen because I have the gazebo window selected and now all the commands are going to the gazebo and the gazebo doesn't know what to do with them. However, if I select this terminal where my uh, tail up node is running, so now I can command the robot to maybe turn, uh, to stop, and then to go forward, backwards, um, etc. So the goal is then to have all of this brought up for, for you uh, within one launch file. And then another point is you should have this Teleop twist keyboard node. You should have it compiled from source, same as we did with uh, the template package in the ROS lecture. Um, and then you can see this. So right now, if you type ROS CD Teleop, the Teleop, there we go, twist keyboard. So for me here, you can see that mine is in inside, it's a system install, it's inside opt ROS. But for you, when you do the same command, it should be inside uh, your workspace. And this brings me to the end of the exercise introduction. Are there any questions before you start?